After releasing my full movie breakdown for Denis Villeneuve's Dune, there were still many things to address surrounding events, props and logic towards the world that the director adapted for the big screen. From Paul's dreams to Jameis to Baron Harkonnen's use of a shield, I'm going to be answering some of the biggest questions from Dune in the aim to help the non-reader discover things they missed and also aid those who are familiar with the novel to compare the events that take place. This analysis will contain spoilers, so if you do happen to be someone who hasn't seen the film yet, then I would recommend watching this video after you've seen it. Also, a lot of things I discuss continue from what I explained in my breakdown the other day, so I would definitely suggest checking out that video first, which is linked in the description. But if you want to keep up to date on any of my future content on Dune 2021, then don't forget to support this video by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. Also, feel free to check me out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Instagram at Cortex Videos, which is all linked in the description below. But without further ado, let's dive into some of the biggest questions from Dune Explained. Starting with the Gom Jabbar test, one of the questions that immediately comes to mind revolves around how much did Paul actually know and understand about the Bene Gesserit's abilities, and what did he know about his mother's connection to the Order? Well, it becomes clear that Paul had spent his entire life pampered on his family's planet, and we learn quite early on in a scene after the Gom Jabbar test that he also never really knew what it meant for his mother to be a Bene Gesserit. He had strange dreams, but he considers them to be only dreams. This is, of course, until the day his mother pulls him out of bed to meet the Reverend Mother, Bene Gesserit. We see that Helen Moheim tortures and almost kills Paul while his own mother guards the door so that no one prevents this test from taking place. He thus discovers his mother is not totally devoted to him, to his father, and to their house, that she has another allegiance. And this is, of course, the Bene Gesserit. The Bene Gesserit are a sorority that has existed for thousands of years, serving as companions and advisors for the Emperor and the Great Houses. They also have their own objective, and as an exclusive solidarity between members of this order. For thousands of years, they have practiced eugenics, pushing their members to have a daughter with a specific noble, who would later marry another noble by seeking to create a powerful being. In the story, Jessica is only ordered to have daughters with Duke Leto, and the Bene Gesserit have the power to choose the sex of their baby, but she disobeyed and had a son. This is mentioned in the film in a conversation between the Reverend Mother and Lady Jessica, once again following the Gom Jabbar scene. But in addition to Jessica disobeying, she decided in secret to teach Paul the knowledge of the Sisterhood, which only women of this order are allowed to know. So by birth and knowledge, Paul has access to powers he shouldn't have, and is believed to be the being that the Order were waiting for, but arriving earlier than expected, which thwarts their plans. And this leads us into an interesting talking point. What are Paul's powers that we mostly see through his dreams in this opening chapter? To explain as simply as possible, Paul sees possible futures but nothing written in stone. An example in the film that makes this more clear is the moment towards the end where Paul and Jessica are still on the run in the desert and they eventually attract a gigantic sandworm. In attracting this worm, Paul has made a mistake which results in Jameis, the Fremen warrior he fights in the climactic scene, not trusting him, ultimately leading to the character's death. If Paul hadn't attracted the sandworm like this, then maybe Jameis could have become the friend of his visions, as we saw on multiple occasions throughout the film. In addition, Paul's visions are sometimes more symbolic than an actual transcript of things to come. Jameis says in one of them, he'll show him the way of the desert. The Fremen are a rough pact with their own specific custom. By challenging and getting Paul to kill him, Jameis shows the young Atreides the way his people do things, which allows Paul to be accepted by them. 
So to summarize this answer, it all comes down to Paul seeing different possible futures. In one of the futures, Jameis was his friend, but Paul's actions created a series of events that prevented the future he saw from happening. And at the same time, the visions could also be symbolic, which is something that will likely be explored more deeply in the next film. And speaking of the Fremen, this is where we can begin to talk about and explain their big prophecy. It's made clear to us in the film that the Fremen, the natives of Arrakis, believe that Jessica and Paul are fulfillers of a prophecy that claims a Bene Gesserit woman will arrive on Arrakis with a son who will lead them to terraform the Arrakis desert environment into a lush green world. Throughout the film, from the moment the Atreides arrive on Arrakis, the Fremen chant and refer to Paul as the Lisan al Gaib. This is known as the voice from the outer world and is outlined in Fremen messianic legends, heavily influenced by the Bene Gesserit's Missionaria Protectiva. It is also translated as the giver of water. Towards the end of the film, the Fremen, or in particular Chani, also names Paul the Mardi. The difference between these is that the Lisan al Gaib is defined as prophet and talker, whereas the Mardi is defined as the savior and doer. Effectively, the al Gaib prophesies the incoming Mardi, who is going to get the job done. And after Paul wins the fatal fight at the end of the film, the Fremen clearly begin to see the young Duke as their Mardi. So I hope that's more clear now as some may get confused with the evident terms and it's understandable why. But keeping on course with the Fremen, it's also important that we start to define some of the props they use and their demonstrated attraction to the importance of water. Starting with the still suits, you really get a sense of their purpose as not just protective clothing, but as a symbiotic part of a being's survival in the desert. The value of water and the Fremen customs around the still suits, and all of it is very well portrayed in the movie. A still suit is a full body suit worn in the open desert on the planet Arrakis that was designed to preserve the body's moisture. It consisted of various layers that would absorb the body's moisture through sweating and urination and then filter the impurities so that drinkable water would be circulated to catch pockets. The individual could then drink the reclaimed water from a tube attached to the neck. A still suit kept in working order and maintained properly permitted the wearer to survive for weeks in the open desert. Stilger properly shows their commitment to this in multiple times in the film, spitting as a greeting to Duke Leto, and also towards the final scene, he says to Jessica in response to her offering to give them resources that nothing is more important than the water in their flesh. But again, the use of the still suit is really done well in the film, and in particular, the first scene with Liat Kynes helping the Atreides fit into their suits tells you a lot about their importance. There's also a great video on YouTube by the channel called Wired, which includes the costume designers breaking this down and relating to NASA in our real world, so I would recommend watching that if you want to know some extended details. Coming to the next important element, which also connects heavily to the Fremen, we have the sandworms, the use of thumpers, and the brief cameo of a sandwalk. The sandworm was a native life form of the planet Arrakis. It lived in the vast deserts and sand dunes that stretched across the surface of the planet. Most importantly, sandworms are an essential factor in the creation of the spice melange. Attracted to rhythmic vibrations on the surface, they would breach in pursuit of the origin of such vibrations. We see this numerous times in the film, which perfectly adapts the moments from the book, and this was an effort by the sandworms to defend their territory, of which they were highly protective. Thus, to see a worm and live to tell about it was extremely rare, save for the mysterious Fremen who had achieved some kind of mastery over the beast. And we see a glimpse of this at the end of the film, where a Fremen native is riding a sandworm, something that Dune Part 2 is going to get into much more. But when it comes to the Fremen using thumpers, how does this device attract the massive sandworms, and does it correlate with the appearance in which a worm confronts Jessica and Paul before they meet with the Fremen? 
Well, the thumper is the noise generator which we also see used by Liat Kynes earlier on, where she attracts the worms by their rhythmic noises. But then there's also that confrontation scene from the end of the first trailer, which is put together the way it was so that it's deliberately ambiguous. When the worm stops, it comes out the sand and looks down at Paul for a long period of time before a thumper is even activated by the Fremen. Essentially, we don't know if the worm recognises Paul or whether it is confused by the thumper. If it's the former, then it would tie into the Spice Harvester scene where Paul is communicating with the worm, calling it an old man of the desert, which is given the phrase Shai Halud by Liat Kynes later on. And alongside the natives using a thumper to get around the sandworms, they also use a special rhythmic walk called the Sandwalk. We do see a brief cameo of this in the film, but it is pushed to the side, and I'm guessing in part 2, the Fremen will explain this more to Paul and Jessica as the journey across the landscape of Arrakis continues. But the walk is described as one where you move in a broken pattern that is unnatural. You pause, step, slide, and repeat in different orders, so that there is no rhythm that might tell a marauding worm that something not of the desert is present. It's all interesting stuff that is shown and explained to different amounts, but like I said, I'm sure that the sequel, if we do get one, will cover more of this. And the last thing to answer surrounding the Fremen is the very important Chris knife that makes appearances in Paul's visions and also in the reality that comes to be. Once the Atreides settle at the palace towards the beginning of the movie, Lady Jessica comes in contact with her new servant, the Shadow Mapes, who herself is a Fremen native. She has been sent to test Jessica, and since she is a Bene Gesserit, Jessica passes the test. Jessica correctly identifies a strange knife that Mapes shows her, calling it a Maker. Mapes also refers to Jessica's child as the one and presents her with a Chris knife. A Chris knife was a knife whose blade was made from the tooth of a dead sandworm of Arrakis, and it was the weapon of choice for the Fremen. It was curved and double edged, milky white in colour, and had a black handle with deep finger ridges, separated from the blade by a slim round ring instead of a shearing guard. The tip of a Chris knife was also commonly poisoned, with an unnamed poison residing where the nerve of the tooth used to be. To the Fremen, the Chris knife was sacred and they maintained much tradition around it. If it was drawn, it could not be resheathed until it had drawn blood. Moreover, the blade was not allowed to be seen by those considered to be outsiders by the tribe, otherwise they would have to die by it or be cleansed in an elaborative ritual. Blades were considered a necessity on Arrakis, and this was because neither shields nor lasguns could be used in the Arrakis desert due to the Holtzman field attracting sandworms. And if you wonder what this is and why they only use lasguns at a few moments in the film, I will be going into this more deeply towards the end of this video because it's also something to keep in mind regarding the combat on display. And this is where we now come to the other side of things in the Dune universe with the Emperor and the Harkonnens. We never see the Emperor in this first film, and he will most likely be present in part 2, but right now with part 1, we still feel the character's presence through the trap that the Atreides have been led into. In Dune lore, the Empire is a delicate power balance between the Great Houses and the Emperor. The latter feared the popularity of Duke Leto, so he decides to help the Harkonnens kill him. He is forced to do this in secret, otherwise the other houses will turn against him and a war will break out. Therefore, it is decided to isolate the Atreides by sending them to Arrakis, a distant planet. There, the Harkonnens and the Emperor's troops will be able to massacre them without leaving any witnesses. And then they can tell the Great Houses that it is a vendetta between the two for control of the spice. House Harkonnen will be frowned upon by the Great Houses, but they will not be able to say anything because it is an old rivalry and there are no witnesses to tell how the clash took place. 
This is something that is briefly alluded to by characters in the film, but respectfully, Denis Villeneuve focuses the story on the shocking nature of the betrayal. And if you are someone who hasn't read the book, don't feel bad about being lost or not comprehending this element of the events, because it is simply a piece of background information that will be more clear once the Emperor is introduced and the characters that surround him in a potential future instalment. And speaking of shocking moments that non-book readers may want to know more about, well, Dr. Yui and Baron Harkonnen are involved in one of the biggest in the film. It all begins when later in the movie, Dr. Yui warns Paul to beware of the Bene Gesserit as he genuinely cares about his survival. We know this because after the events take place, it's the reason why he placed a bag with things to allow Paul and Jessica to survive in the desert, with him suspecting that they would manage to get rid of their jailers. And speaking of Dr. Yui, a man who has Benny Gesserit connections through his wife, we learn that he is grieving over her capture and torture by the Harkonnens. He agreed to sacrifice the entire Atreides house in exchange for a chance to save her. But he isn't fooled by the Baron Eva, with her already having been killed, ultimately fearing this and leading to the Sook Doctor giving Duke Leto poison to kill the Baron. There are a lot of reasons why Yui gives Leto the tooth rather than installing it himself. Yui's a doctor. He knows more than anyone how strong the will to survive is and how hard it is to take one's own life. He also knows deep down that he's a weak man, which is why the Harkonnens were able to leverage him. So he knows that, if given the opportunity, he may hesitate and not be capable of killing himself. Leto's probably strong enough to do the job, and handing off the job to Leto is a cowardly move anyhow, which is part of Yui's character anyway. In addition, there's an act of compassion in giving Leto an easy way out. Leto will likely suffer much greater tortures at the hand of the Baron than Yui will. This decision by Yui spares him that. The Baron is of course paranoid and has a personal shield on him all the time. The idea was that Leto, who seems helpless, would be able to lure the Baron closer than Yui would ever be able to get. Remember, Yui is being coerced. He's not a real Harkonnen retainer, he's an enemy that is being coerced. So, of course, the Baron would never drop his guard around Yui. On top of this, when it comes to the shocking moment when Duke Leto bites down on the tooth and releases the poisonous gas, the Baron's personal shield slows molecules down and prevents most of the poison from ever coming into contact with him. He also lunges back using suspensers, and the Seleucid mud bath taken by the Baron in a later scene is again something to think about. But to be honest, he mainly takes these to relieve his health problems. And according to the book, yes, the Baron was very lucky in this situation, but his idea to wear a shield and reliance on it in the scene is reflective to the most part of what we see in the novel, and it really helps to deliver on the first act's growing tension. The last question I wanted to address in relation to the villains of Dune Part 1 is the question that some non-readers have towards the laser weapons that we only see used twice in the film. In the movie, they had a laser weapon that was fired from their ship that was insanely powerful, and later on they had a smaller handheld version of such a laser that was still really effective. In the novel, this is called a lasgun. If you were wondering why they wouldn't use that during the battle to just cut through the empty troops, well, there's actually a reason for this. I personally think this should have been explained more in a few lines of dialogue, but I guess since we only see it a couple of times in the movie, it was an attempt to trim down the amount that could have been in the first part alone. Essentially, when such a laser hits an energy shield, it causes a nuclear explosion that can occur in the shield, in the beam, or in the laser weapon. This means you can't beam enemy forces. But could you make a simple nuke with that? Could you put an active shield and a laser gun in a box with a timer attached to the gun, making it shoot at the shield in X amount of seconds, and drop the box from high up? And is that concept explored further in the books? 
Ultimately, it's to justify melee combat in a spacefaring civilization, but as far as excuses go, this one is actually due to world building. In Dune, the Holtzman effect has something to do with interaction of particles on a subatomic scale. It allowed them to create Holtzman drives used to bridge spacetime for faster than light travel, Holtzman shields for personal defense, and suspensors to hover. So all of a sudden, everyone could get a personal energy shield, one that would not allow fast moving objects through, with guns now useless, and only slow moving matter would pass so that the user doesn't suffocate. This opens a possibility for knives and swords. The LAS guns and their energy beam reacts with the Holtzman field of the shield and results in a nuclear reaction. This kills both the wearer and the attacker, and it works the same with ship-to-ship -ship combat. So now you've ended up with a universe where only melee weapons are usable. Projectile guns just reflect from the shield, and las guns cause nuclear explosions. And as a bonus, using atomic weapons on humans is punishable by death. But every great house has a stockpile in case any aliens are ever discovered. Again, if they use them on each other, the rest will annihilate them. All the great houses stockpile atomic weapons anyway, but if you were to use them, presumably all the other houses and the emperor would unite and wipe you out. I think it's ultimately a narrative technique used by Herbert to ground the books so that war can be drawn out and not end very quickly. But you wouldn't want to. For example, nuking a mining settlement when that settlement is necessary to harvest the spice. It's all interesting stuff and mainly implemented to further the discussion on the themes the novel deals with, and that's the case with much of the stuff I have discussed in this video. It's all very dense, but I'm hoping that some of this will be clarified for the non-book reader as we get into Dune Part 2. But that was my video discussing some of the questions that arose from Dune 2021. I'm sure there will be many other things that pop up on rewatch and other examples which you guys may have picked out, so don't forget to let me know down below in the comment section. Also, if there is anything else that you can add to the topics I already raised in this video, then let me know as it will be interesting to dissect the finer details as time passes. For more breakdown videos on Denis Villeneuve's Dune, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it, I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.